a very interesting day in the world of sports. And I, I think sometimes we, in this world where we're trying to, you know, grow brands and everybody's got to have the most viewers and sometimes we get crazy with headlines. But is it too much of a headline? Is it crazy to say that yesterday was the day that college football changed forever? Again, because it seems like we're getting those days more and more often. And if you take stock of what happened yesterday to make it truly a historic day in college athletics, you have every major entity involved in college athletics agreeing to pay these NIL settlements. And you have every major entity agreeing to rule and regulation changes that allow them at the university level now to pay college athletes directly. It is a significant a significant shift, excuse me, from the way that business has been done for generations in college athletics. And I don't necessarily believe that it is a good thing. In the comment section today, let's talk about the basic question. Do you think it is a good idea to pay college athletes? What I would tell you is right, wrong, good, bad. I think it almost doesn't matter. It's the inevitable outcome. When you are making billions of dollars on the backs of people laboring for your profit, you have to compensate them. And this always goes back to these conversations about what is the value of an education and are they not being compensated enough through that? Let's not even go there. Let's not pretend that a college scholarship is somehow level compensation based on the money that is being generated especially by the stars of college athletics. Jake, is it a good idea to pay college athletes directly from the universities? I, I mean, I think it's better than than what we have working now, you know, uh, which is like just sort of a wild, wild west of kids making money from whatever sponsor is willing to pony up the money. But I, I, I think the hard part is, is that, you know, when you start looking into this settlement and you start to understand that, you know, all, all these deals are going to have to go through the school directly, which gives them, a, uh, uh, you know, a layer of control. Um, you know, you start to understand that, okay, well, schools are the ones, you know, who are responsible for approving or not approving or, you know, uh, any, any these NIL deals, then then what what then becomes of it at a conference level? Because once the schools are in control, now commissioners can start looking at it and saying, okay, hey, Baylor, like you got to start doing more NIL or hey, Texas Tech or hey, Alabama or hey, Ohio State. Like, you know, you can start looking at it at a school level. And so I think once again, that may lead us down a path where it goes away from doing deals for the kid uh, as opposed to doing deals just to make as much money as possible. And the other thing that came to mind yesterday when this came out was, okay, cool, the schools are going to handle all of this. What what what's the fine fine print going to say? Like, is there going to be uh you know a lot of incentive laden nil stuff? What what are the ways the schools are going to scheme to make these nil deals work for them? So that was one of my initial things. And it, so, is it a good idea? I, I don't know if it's if it's good or bad yet. I think it really depends on how institutions handle nil because uh, uh, because I do think that it's going to be case by case and. I think the hard part is if you're an athlete right now, your your window in time to go out and make all this, you know, un unfiltered or unregulated NIL money just came to an end with this settlement. And and I think that's the hard part is like now schools are going to complain about all this back pay and everything, but today's current athlete has to sit here and say, okay, well, what about me? Because I'm not the All American from 2015 or whatever that's getting his back pay. I'm here now. How can I go out and make money uh, in today's NIL marketplace? And, and the other thing, the other verbiage that I was a little concerned about is this whole concept of, you know, your quote unquote true value for NIL and how we're going to determine that. So there need there's going to be a system, according to the settlement, that gets developed for for defining what player A versus player B's value is it's not just going to be your value is what someone's you know willing to pay you which i think is what it should be i think it should be hey if if a kid goes out and talks to a company and they're willing to pay him a million bucks a season you just need to run that through the school and you're good to go that's how it should be 
But I don't think it's going to be that way. I think that schools are going to garner control and they're going to say, well, your true value in NIL is actually only $3, even though this company over here from the tech sector is willing to pay you $10. Yeah, I, I don't know what you do. I don't know what you do with that in particular. I, I think you're worth what somebody's willing to pay you. But I think we like to live in these idealistic societies where, uh, you know, we we think that education's important. Like I look at the statement from Notre Dame. And the president of Notre Dame, I, I think, shows you why we are where we are. And I am a Notre Dame fan through and through. But this right here, this statement is embarrassing to me. That you have a guy who, as the president of Notre Dame, would say something to the effect of, uh, to save the great American institution of college sports, Congress must pass legislation that preempts the current patchwork of state laws, establish that our athletes are not employees, but students seeking college degrees. They're not students seeking college degrees. And I understand that most college athletes will never play professionally. But let's not sit here and say little Jimmy from Los Angeles is going to play college football at Notre Dame in this case or whatever school you want to point to because he's seeking a college degree. No, he's seeking a payday. Yeah. And we need to understand that. And I, I, I look at statements like that from Notre Dame and I, I say to myself, this is why we are where we are. Because you didn't want to share the billions that you made with the young people that made you those billions. Did the did the NCAA have a significant hand in making that money? Yes, it did. But you were at the very minimum full share partners with the, the, the kids on the field and the court. And you didn't want to pay them. You didn't want to pay the revenue generating athletes, even a single penny. You thought Pell Grants and a chicken sandwich were enough to get kids by. It was never enough. And I think we're, I, I truly do not believe that this change would have ever happened unless violence was forced upon the old heads that run these universities. I think that's the only reason that we're, that we got the settlement that we got and these kids are getting paid. Mm -hmm. That's it. Because you can't tell me these guys would have reached into their pocket voluntarily. I don't buy that for a second. Yeah, they never have. Never will. Never. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. it, it's just not, that's not how the rich stay rich, right? I mean, they, they're, they're going to fight to the death to make sure that they don't have to pay more than what they should be. Yeah. And I, I think what's really going to happen is we're going to limit opportunities. That's what this will come down yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, that's why I say like this this whole situation where it runs through the school, I'm telling you, is going to be a problem. Yeah. You're, you're, you're going to get to a place where schools are going to start doing deals. And the first couple, you know, they're they are going to be fine. But then schools are going to look at those deals and they're going to say, okay, well, where can we save money? How can we, you know, how can we, you know, without intentionally screwing the kid, how can we save money? You know, how can we get through this deal and save you know, as many of our dollars as possible. And I think that's where I have real trouble with this because NIL was first rolled out as a stopgap to to allow kids to make money off their name, image, and likeness yes. and allow kids to say, hey, you know, you're Caleb Williams or you're Brock Bowers or you're whoever, and you can go out and have sponsors essentially pay you to represent them because you're so good at what you do. And I've never understood why, you know, the system has to get mm. in the way of that. Why, why, why are we in a place where we are so obsessed with what these kids make or don't make? Let them go and do that. Like they should be able to just go out into the marketplace and do that. Yes. And, and, and for some reason, 
we had to turn this into, oh, well, student athlete versus employee. And well, if he's going to make that much, then everyone's got to make that much. And, and it's just like, no, dude, actually, that's not the case. The case is that this situation should have been like every other thing in our country. Hey, business owner A is really good at what they do. They're going to make a lot more money than business owner B who's running a, a, a you know, a, a, a shop out of their garage. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the essence of our country. Yet here we are treating NIL like it's some special thing that that we got to make sure that we take care of the schools and we got to make sure that the system is fine. And then I get articles this week talking about how, hey, this settlement, while uncomfortable, was necessary to save college athletics from bankruptcy. So let me get this yeah. right. You're, you're, you're reaching into the kid's pocket again, and that's why you risk bankruptcy. Well, I, I think like, I think all this does is create a, a much clearer line of the haves and the haves not. Yeah. When you're paying 20 to 20, I think it's 20 to 22 million dollars a year. How many how many schools can compete? I'll go back to the Boise State conversation. Can Boise State compete with LSU? Brian Kelly, who talked about this a few weeks ago. They cannot. LSU is far more capable of paying $20 million than Boise State. And you're simply going to have a situation where a lot of these universities become afterthoughts. You are going to, whether you want to or not, see college athletic programs die. You are going to see historically competitive programs no longer have the wherewithal or the desire to compete at the highest levels financially. And by the way, what happens when the big boys like LSU take the stance like Brian Kelly did of, hey, we're not looking to, to bring kids in who just want to make money. You you want to be an LSU Tiger? That's great. So what happens if they become successful with that angle and they don't end up having to spend all of their NIL budget? Let's say they save $5 million a year in NIL. So does that roll over to next year? Is there an obligation to, to you know, use those earmarked funds uh, for NIL only, well, or can you save and shift? And and that's the type of scheming I'm talking about. And you look at all these tweets from Ross yesterday about structure and like, you know, ref sharing and, and cap rules and roster rules and, you know, eliminating scholarship stuff, caps, right? Like all this stuff, all of this stuff in this settlement is the scheming set up for the schools and for the NCAA to work through NIO. They have to give themselves yeah. a way to, to say, okay, cool. Yeah. You know what? Uh, yeah. You know, Georgia, they did everything they could to spend all their NIL money, but you know, looks like they just had a couple extra mil that they weren't able to allocate. So we're going to throw that back into the athletic budget, right? Like would anybody be surprised if that type of behavior happened as part of the settlement two years from now? Like, I, I don't know. Be. I, we'll find out. I think it is. I think I think the game has changed irrevocably. And I think yeah. I look at the damage that is. No, you can't unwind the watch here, man. Like uh, here, here's a question. You want to be terrified as a if you are a Big 12 fan and we have a lot of Big 12 fans that watch this show. This right here should terrify you. The fact that you made five hundred and ten million dollars. Uh, well, what do you say? Well, the ACC, certainly, uh, they're worse than, oh, wait, they're not $200 million more than you. Well, the PAC 12, no, nope, hundred million dollars more than you, but the big 10, uh, 380 or $370 million more than you. And I would remind you the SEC's at 850 and you are at $510 million. It's shocking. And you're losing Texas and Oklahoma. It's shocking yeah. that we we sit here and we talk about this on a regular basis. And you look at these numbers. And if you are a fan of the Big 12, you should be worried. Because I don't know how you make up a $370 million financial gap. I, I don't know how you do that. Furthermore, if the ACC is crying poor, and they're a hundred million dollars further ahead than you are. What is the Big Twelve without Texas and Oklahoma? And we sit here every day, and I feel like on a weekly basis we ask the question: Who's the brand in the Big Twelve? 
Well, the reason we're asking who the brand is is because you're losing Texas and Oklahoma, the only brands you had, and you're picking up four universities in Colorado, Utah, and the Arizona schools that are not big brands. And I don't see how that covers even half of that win that shortfall. Yeah, and in in that in that screenshot for the Big Twelve, you'll notice it says they got Texas and Oklahoma's full shares. So as part of that five hundred and ten million, Texas and Oklahoma's full TV shares uh, and college football playoff shares went to the conference. And so you 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 begin to understand that not only is Brett Yormark having to figure out how to add schools, but he's also having to figure out how to play with you know one hand tied behind his back until he can get revenue up. And and that's why I say once again. Let me let me be repetitive for like the fifth time this week. This is why things like the Super League are never dead because conferences need more money to work with. Yeah, like you're talking about a conference that you know is probably going to be 480, 500 mil for revenue after you add these schools and you lose Texas and Oklahoma. I would think because you're adding four and losing two, well, you'd be I, able I, to be. You also have a, a you got to remember, they have a, a better TV contract. They have new revenue streams through basketball. I'm telling you, though, there you don't make up a $300 million shortfall. You're never going to be the behemoth. But can you get to $800 million? Because I think we all can agree sitting here talking about this. The the Big Ten and the SEC are going to make a billion dollars this year each. They're going to make a billion billion dollars. Where does the Big 12 go from here? Mm -hmm. Because it is, it is, it's pretty bleak when you're, I mean, you're almost 50% behind. And the ACC, the biggest brands in the ACC are talking about how they're not making money and they can't compete. Can the Big 12 compete? And as we talked about yesterday, I'll continue to point at Mike Gundy. I'll continue to point uh, to Joey McGuire in Lubbock. Sonny Dykes in Fort Worth. You better get your ass in gear. Why did Baylor not fire Dave Aranda? Hey, great basketball program. Football's killing you. And you are living and dying in this conference on football. And I, I, I maybe I'm alone in this. I don't see people desperate to succeed in football in this conference. No, I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, like with Mike Gundy as an example, the, or Dave Aranda is another good example. Uh, there's a lot of these guys who are the old guard who have been there for too long and are comfortable and just kind of doing things the way they've always been done. And again, the like even sitting here now, how do you have a head coach of a of a D1 Power Four uh, football team uh, that doesn't embrace NIL? That doesn't embrace the portal. That doesn't embrace the new wave of how things are done. I don't know how that's possible. And I don't know how, you know, schools continue to be comfortable with it. And it's like, I don't know. You know, you look at the ACC and there's been much bandied about and written about Dabo at Clemson not being, not, not being positive and warm and embracing, um, you know, uh, of NIL and, and the portal and the way this new system works. Instead, we want to talk about, Ah, well, I'm not interested in a player who just wants to get paid. Well, you damn well better get interested because every player wants to get paid now. And and that's just the way it is. And, and what are you saying? Like, you want, listen, Brian Kelly, Clemson, Boise, you guys want to talk about how shitty NIL is? Do that over a steak and a, and a, a, a glass of scotch. Not in front of microphones, not in front of cameras, not in front of the media. Yeah. You standing up there and talking about how you, you're you not going to allow freshmen to cut NIL deals? Fuck out of here. Look, who's going, who, what freshman is like, man, I'm a, I'm a top corner in the country. Let me go to Boise and not make NIL money. That's wild to me. Yeah. That. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Anyway, I, I am I am quite disappointed we are here. I am quite disappointed we are here. But I think it, it is, was it was an inevitability based on where things were headed. And I and I think that, you know, it, it, it this is why I continue to say, man, it it, it it is it is truly, in my opinion, the way I see the sport and the landscape. Whatever the Super League God tier thing is going to be called, whatever the label is going to be, but it's Jake, going the, the to God, happen. The God tier is dead. Yeah, well, 
Not anymore, it's not. Because <laughs> when you've got conferences that have this much of a disparity in revenue, um, but they all share a college football playoff system, you're you're talking about lions and gazelles chilling in the same room, man. You're talking about apples and oranges here, man. Like, uh, I don't think Brett Yormark's doing a bad job at all, but I I don't think he's he's you know fighting the fight with the same amount of weaponry here, man. And and that's where I say, dude, like you need to level the playing field on some level. So and, again, I, I just ask, what is what are the big brands in the in the Big Twelve? You don't have any, and that's not the SEC or the Big Ten's fault. No, but it's not. But the problem is, is that you're also not a conference that is attractive to to huge brands. Like you're just not. I think that like every conference of the Power Four has sort of this image about it, right? Like, hey, you think SEC, you think national championships on the football field, right? You think Big Ten? You, you think you, you think sign stealer guy? You think sign stealer guy in hurdles and showers, right? <laughs> You you wow. you think Big Twelve? You you think basketball and then solid football? Bucky's Bucky's right? barbecue sandwiches, yeah, pulled pork and you know lot lizards. We get it, right? Like <laughs> like you, that's what you think about, and so that's why I say with Brett Yormark and the Big Twelve, you're a wonderful basketball conference, but you need to find that next thing. And I don't know if that at at this point, I don't know that that's a a, a adding a big brand because I'm not sure there's one available. Uh, I, I don't know if it's like, you know, a new initiative in basketball or something like they got to come up with something that's not been done. I know. Yet. Let's get crazy. Win fucking football games. But they're not going to do that. Right. Man. But they're not going to do that. I don't I don't fully agree with that. I think the problem is we're in a right now business. You don't have time to wait for, you know, bald ego down at Baylor to get fired. You don't have time to wait for Houston hold to on, develop. Hold on. Did you just say bald eagle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good old sweaty scalp down there. You know, hey, Dave, you do you, dude. Uh, you don't have time to wait for Dave Aranda to figure it out. You don't have time to wait for Houston to figure it out. Do you understand that Houston? What is Houston? What is Baylor? Uh, BYU. It's five years away, at least. Bro, At this least. thing's going to be over in two minutes. You're telling me you want to wait five years. You got to win right now. You have to, right now, you have legit two years. My opinion, based on conversations I've had with people, I think the God tier is two years away. That's the time that you have to show what you can do. Well, think about how long it took to, to expand the college football uh, playoff model. Too long. Right? But... Once that conversation started, right? Like, yeah, obviously it took too long. I think we, we've we been asking for it for, you know, since probably 2018. I think everyone was like, yeah, we probably need eight teams, probably need 10 teams, probably need, you know, need to expand this. But once it really got going, like once people really started talking about it, it took about 18 months, two yeah. years. Like that's the timeline. That's how long it takes to change something. How and long until we expand the NCAA tournament? 100%. Same conversation, right? Like, and, and, and that's where I say, Again, like I, I don't mean to hate on the Big 12, man, but you don't have the same, you know, firepower that these other conferences have. It would be a different conversation if you were the SEC and you were bad at business, right? That's the Pac 12's conundrum. Hey, really good on the football field, better than With anyone Huge knows brands, about. USC, With huge brands. Oregon, Washington competing Turns for a out national you championship. Were money. Turns out you were making money. You were just so bad on the PL sheet that your conference burned down. So the problem is, is that the Big 12 is the opposite. The Big 12 is so damn good on the PL sheet that that they are surviving and they're getting by, but they don't have a way right James, now to get to next. James, why choose violence today? This is not my opinion. Remember, James says, if you weren't winning natties, your season is terrible. Uh, no. You know what the truth is? If you're not consistently competing for a national championship in college football, you are irrelevant. And you are not making money. Congratulations on going to your stupid fucking nobody cares bowl game every year where your best players don't compete. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. I continue and I ask you again, and all of the all of the people that want to sit here and fillet Mike Gundy. 
because I hear it in the comments section. I'm just going to ask you, when's the, when is the last time that you were like, wow, Mike Gundy's got Oklahoma State sitting at the top of the college football oh, world? Well, Monty, they went to the Big 12 championship game last year. Here, here are their bowl games. And he goes to bowl games. Here are their bowl games. The Independence Bowl, the Insight Bowl, the Holiday Bowl, the Cotton Bowl, the Alamo Bowl. Okay, 2011, the Fiesta Bowl, you finished third in the country. Great. Okay, first ha good year. You rebound from 12 and 1 to go 8 and 5, Heart of Dallas, Cotton Bowl, Cactus Bowl, Sugar Bowl, where uh, you lost and you finished 20th in the country. Alamo Bowl, Camping World Bowl, Liberty Bowl, Texas Bowl, Cheese It Bowl, Fiesta Bowl in 2021, 12 and 2. You win it, you finish seventh in the country. Oh, wait, that's right. You you weren't competing for a national championship that year either. Uh, guaranteed Rate Bowl. The Texas Bowl. You have not been relevant in in at the top of college football, but one year, perhaps, back in 2011. And you want to say that that's good enough. So when you say if winning is the standard, James, I got news for you, Slick. <laughs> Dude's not winning. You're not Dude winning. Dude is going to... Average ass, nobody cares. Bowl game. Do you and understand? Look at his look at his records. Look at his records since 2018. Seven and six, eight and five, eight and three, 12 and two, seven and six, 10 and four last year. That's not elite. That's not elite. That's not elite. And we can sit here and you 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 want to talk about you want to talk about you know how you didn't need bedlam. You didn't like if you look at look at Lincoln Riley in that same window at at, at Oklahoma. See, this is a conversation you don't want to have. Yeah, it is. You woke up yeah. and you fucking chose violence. Well, get smacked in the face with the fact that Lincoln Riley's a better football coach than Mike Gundy is. At Oklahoma, his worst record in his five years at Oklahoma was nine and two. And they went to the Cotton Bowl that year and finished six in the country. His worst ranking in his five years when he was kicking the shit out of Mike Gundy yeah. <laughs> was 10th in the country. Ah, oh, he's terrible. Oh, my God. Oh. So, remember Mike Gundy standing at the, the door holding it open so Oklahoma could leave. I'll take Lincoln Riley every day over Mike Gundy. Mike Gundy is... A, a solid coach. If you if you want to compete, you want to go to the Texas Bowl, and you want to go to the Valero Texas Bowl, and you want to go to the Heart of Texas Bowl, and you want to go to Bucky's and get a barbecue sandwich. And hey, cool, neat, all right, that's great. I want to win national championships. Well, and I think the other part of the conversation with Lincoln too, and and this is what I've always said about Lincoln, right? And it's and it's what's defined his career. Right, not a national championship winner, but someone who's going to make your conference a lot of freaking money. And the way he's going to do that is he's going to go to big time bowl game. What were what were what was the bowl games that he that Lincoln would go to there in his in his window? Lincoln Riley went to the Rose, the Orange, the Peach, the Cotton, and the Alamo Bowl. So so pretty pretty big time bowl games there. Like those are national re nationally relevant big time bowl games. And the other thing that Lincoln is notorious for is Heisman Trophy winners and. The reason I bring that side of it up is because if Mike Gundy was, you know, doing what he's doing, right? Typically a seven, eight win team. Typically one year he'll pop off for 10 or 12 wins and then he'll be right back to seven, eight wins. But every year he had a Heisman trophy candidate, let's say, or he had, uh, you know, he, he, he had something that made the program special, something that sort of set them apart and made you want to come to Stillwater then I wouldn't be as hard on them because at that point, kids want to come and play in your conference and at your school. But the very reason that Oklahoma was able to go with Texas to the SEC as a package deal is because of what Lincoln did. Lincoln put Oklahoma on the map in the sense of, hey, Oklahoma's a program that's big time and can compete at the top of college football. So I'm sorry. If you want to wake up and be a complete red ass in your comment about Mike Gundy, go ahead. 
but your winning standard is way too low in Stillwater. And the idea that 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 people are celebrating this guy and like Mike Gundy's the best thing we've ever seen tells me everything I need to know about the Big 12, which is precisely the point I've been making this morning, which is cool. You have Brett Yormark, and he's done a lot of good things, and I love Brett. I think he's a great commissioner of the conference, man. I think you're in really good hands from that side of the conversation. The problem is Brett doesn't have uh, head football coaches in his conference who, frankly, give a damn to move into the modern day of college football. And Correct. that would be, you know, Mike Gundy. I, uh, frankly, I throw Sonny Dykes into that a little bit. Uh, I would definitely throw Buddy at Texas Tech, Joey McGuire. Buddy. Right? I would definitely throw Dana Holgerson, who, before he got fired at Houston, right? Like all these coaches that don't want to get on board and don't want to play the Portal NIL game and want to complain and want to say, oh, well, all these kids want is to get paid. Yeah, you're damn right they do. Because what have you been doing the last decade? Oh, that's right. You've been getting paid to do what you do. And then we want to vilify the kid. And then we want to complain about why the Big 12 has only $500 million in revenue. So forgive me, James, for holding Mike Gundy to a bit of a higher standard than eight wins a year. Sorry, dude. I know that that's outlandish. I know it's outlandish. I think the amazing part is, is that you have, yeah. He also says Mike Gundy is as successful as Utah's coach. I would remind you that Kyle Whittingham has an undefeated national championship season. I, 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 how, how, when, when Lincoln Riley's where, teams where, have no defense where, where I, I'm just, what? I'm just asking when, when was Mike Gundy undefeated and when was he ever a BCS buster? He's at a larger brand, Oklahoma state, and you're comparing him to Kyle Whittingham. Pull anybody in this country and ask them if they want Mike Gundy or Kyle Whittingham. They're taking Kyle Whittingham every single time. Every single time. And you're going to find out this year. It's wild to me that you truly believe that Lincoln Riley's defense is. Okay, so Lincoln Riley doesn't have defense. He's still a better football coach than Mike Gundy. So let me get this right. Lincoln Riley averages 12 wins a year with no defense, and you're still taking Mike Why, Gundy why can't you just own the fact that Oklahoma State is the reason that right now today is the reason that the Big 12 has no brands? Why can't you own that? I don't understand it. It's This conference is never going to grow and succeed until... People like Mike Gundy are no longer the head coach at Oklahoma State. When you quite literally say, I don't want to play Oklahoma, and then stand on the dais and cry after you beat Oklahoma, get get out of here. I I just, it's embarrassing to me. It's Kyle Whittingham is 166 or 162 and 79. Mike Gundy's 166 and 79. How much better? And I would also remind you, he's at Utah, Kyle Whittingham, uh, which is a much more difficult recruiting situation than Oklahoma State. The history of Utah football is Kyle Whittingham. He doesn't have Barry Sanders. He doesn't have Thurman Thomas. And yet, Kyle Whittingham's got better quarterbacks than you. Kyle Whittingham's a better recruiter than you are. Which I might point out is really saying something about the quarterbacks. Kyle (laughs) Whittingham puts dudes in the NFL at a very high level. And Kyle Whittingham has a 13-0 Sugar Bowl season. And and Kyle Whittingham has been to -to back-to-back Rose Bowls. And I'd also point out, what are we Since talking we're about? We're trying to die on the Mike Gundy Hill this morning. If we're going to compare Mike Gundy and Kyle Whittingham's record, uh, why don't we compare the overall conference records on the football field? Because I'm pretty sure the Pac 12 has been a damn good football conference 
uh, when you compare it to the Big 12. They both have 100 wins in their conference. Good God Winningham's Lord. got 100 wins versus 60 losses. Mike Gundy's 102 and 63. And the Pac-12 was a superior football conference to the to the Big 12 in the last several years. So I, I this is the theology. This is the thought pro- oh, with with all due respect, Oak State James, your thought process and your belief system is why the Big 12 is where it is. Because you're happy being me- mediocre. You're happy, you're happy being just just not good enough. Not good enough. You're you're just, you know. I, I just think that is. In 2011, Oak State should have been given. I don't care what they should have been given. Who are you, Florida State? Uh, like it, it's it's crazy to me. This is why we are what what we are. Mike Gundy seven and three against Texas. Who cares? Texas sucks. Remember, you can't have it both ways. Texas sucks, but you're seven and three against them. So now all of a sudden, that shitty Texas team. Now you're going to put that up on a mantle that you're seven and three against Texas. So does Texas suck and they're not back or are they amazing? And you beat them seven out of 10 times. And by the way, what have you done for me lately? Come Cause on, you man. got embarrassed, dude. Come on, man. Like honestly, in the championship game this past and season. Thank you. Alabama would have beat the brakes off of Oak state. I, I just, at what point can we have an honest conversation about the big 12? At least, at least big 10 fans. When we were talking about Michigan and the, at least they all acknowledge the conference sucks, right? At least or did it, it, or well did at least in the ACC. Most people agree the conference sucks in football, right? It's it's this kind of thought process. I just don't understand why, you know why. Why is it that Gundy's the one you want to die on the hill for? Like, I get it. You're you're an Oklahoma State guy. You work there. Like, I get the bias on some level, dude. I I I, I'll, I even you know I'll, I'll hand you some of that. But but to come in here with your first comment today and say that you know Monty's opinion is that unless you win a national championship, you had a bad season is one of the dumbest things you've ever said on this show. Yeah, it's pretty weak. And <laughs> and I don't care about hurting your feelings on this because. You came in here looking to be a red ass, and and here we are. When Gumby is out commenting you, Texas matters, but OU does not. Well, now, if you're an Oklahoma State fan, OU doesn't exist. That's why you didn't want to play Bedlam. Yeah, what's Bedlam? 